Hello everyone. My name is Kim Heinrich and I handle marketing for Meritas. I would like to welcome everyone to today's Meritas Capability Webinar, Absence, Leave, and Disability Management, a Roadmap to Improve Your Leave Program and Enhance Compliance with State and Federal Law. Today's webinar is scheduled to last for 60 minutes, and our presenters are Amy Blaisdell and Eric Eichmeyer of the Meritas Firm in St. Louis, Missouri, Greensfelder, Hemker, and Gale. Today's presenters, uh, Amy will be kicking it off, and she is a partner with Greensfelder and focuses her practice in providing clients with practical day-to-day -day human resources and employee benefits advice. She frequently advises employers regarding compliance with various federal and state laws impacting leave rights, including the ADA, FMLA, ERISA, and FLSA, state workers' compensation, and other state leave laws. Additionally, she routinely advises employers regarding how to properly administer leave rights that may be impacted by multiple different laws and employee benefits plans. Our second presenter is Eric Eichmeyer, also a lawyer at Greensfelder, and has over 23 years of experience in workers' compensation defense, representing self-insured employers, as well as employers and insurers at all stages of litigation in both Missouri and Illinois. He has handled cases at both the trial and appellate level, and has successfully argued cases before both the Labor and Industrial Relations Commission and Missouri Court of Appeals. Now before turning the presentation over to Amy, I would like to cover a few housekeeping items. As you've likely noticed, all phone lines are muted. However, we would like to encourage you to interact with the presenters throughout the presentation, and you can do that by using the chat feature on the lower left hand side of your screen. So you can type in questions at any time and they will go directly to Amy and Eric. Should you have any difficulties with your audio line at any time, please hit star zero and someone will be on the line immediately to help you with technical support. So with that, Amy, are you ready to get started? Yes. All Great, right. take it away. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for this presentation. Uh, we wanted to start off with some statistics about leaves of absence and how employers view that in terms of their management priorities because I, this, this information is sort of what um, prompted us to do this presentation and I think it will help everyone understand that we all share similar struggles in our um, jobs of trying to manage leaves of absence and the impact that they have on the organization. Uh, Mercer did a survey uh, on absence and disability management in 2010, and in that study, employers were asked to rate their top management priorities in terms of absence management. And of the employers that responded, almost 50%, you see there 46%, ranked reducing the impact of absence on the business operations and improving the process for FMLA administration as number one, those two items tied. Uh, we're going to talk today about intermittent FML tools in particular um, because I know that's a source of angst for many of you. Next, um, although this is such a huge priority for employers, 31% of employers responded that they have trouble evaluating the clinical reasons for leaves in the first instance, um, which when you dovetail that with the 8% of employers or of, of all employees who are taking FMLA leave, you start to see the impact that this has on an organization. Finally, from a dollars and cents standpoint, um, in the Mercer study, it was reported that for every $1 spent on payroll, 13 cents is spent on paid absences. So for an employee who has an average salary of $50,000 a year, you're talking about an additional $6,500 for paid absences. And that doesn't consider the indirect costs that come from things like replacement labor, um, overtime of other employees, et cetera. If you, if you kind of extrapolated those um, numbers out over an employer with 5,000 employees, again using that same $50,000 annual salary, you'd see the impact is $33 million in annual paid time off benefits. So obviously this um, 
issue has significant impact for all of us. We wanted to start out um, today by getting a little bit of information from you as our audience so that um, we have, I think, a pretty varied audience here. We want to see how much everybody knows what their level of comfort is with the various laws that we're going to talk about today. So if you could just start by answering this first question on your computer, how would you rate your knowledge of the Americans with Disabilities Act? We'll wait for some of the responses to come in. There's a couple more seconds. All right, we'll go ahead and skip to the results here. So on the, on the whole, um, you know, we're, we're a pretty mixed audience. We've got more people who say their knowledge is fair than good, but some folks also who um, are willing to admit the weakness and say, <laughs> and say that it's um, poor. So well, we're here to help today. Um, next, I want you to do the same thing, rate your knowledge, but this time of the Family and Medical Leave Act. People are much more confident in their knowledge of the Family Medical Leave Act than the ADA, which is somewhat surprising to me because the FMLA is obviously much more dense in terms of its content than, than the ADA. So maybe those additional regulations help people um, understand it better. Finally, or not finally, but let's rate our knowledge on the State Workers' Compensation Act for your particular state. And this is very telling, and this is why Eric is on the phone. Um, I anticipated that because we have a large group of HR legal um, team members on this call, that our weakness as a group overall was going to be in the area of workers' compensation. Um, and so Eric is here to help shed some light on how work comp uh, impacts these other laws. How would you rate your knowledge of ERISA, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act? Again, not a surprise to me. This is another um, one of the reasons since my practice crosses over the two areas that we thought this would be a good um, session. Now, uh, this one asks, how would you rate your knowledge of workers' compensation and ERISA? But what I really want to know here is, um, how would you rate your knowledge of, of the laws that have been mentioned, so the ADA, the FMLA, Work Comp, and ERISA as a whole. And again, this identifies that we all know that we could use some additional brush up in this area. So today we are going to talk about the key laws impacting leaves of absence, those that we've just covered. Um, we're going to provide a roadmap for you for navigating the overlapping provisions. And we are also going to share some tools to help you reduce the impact of absences on the workplace. As the polls show, looked at in isolation, these laws are pretty easy to read and think to yourself, oh, I understand that. Um, but it's when you have that employee situation that you're called upon to help solve that you suddenly realize as you um, look at these laws as they begin to collide that um, that's where the gray areas arise. These, the Family Medical Leave Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and the State Workers' Compensation Act have frequently been referred to as the Bermuda Triangle. And adding to what I would call the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle is this whole concept of, the, of ERISA. Um, but I think what you're going to find today, hopefully we're going to give you some ease with respect to ERISA as you come to understand how it interplays and uh, the friendly nature really that um, ERISA 
takes on for employers. It's really one of the most employer-friendly statutes because unlike the FMLA, the ADA, and the State Workers' Compensation, State Workers Compensation Act, there is nothing that requires an employer to provide, um, for example, short-term or long-term disability benefit programs. It is important to, to realize, though, that when you do have um, a short-term or long-term disability plan, that you do still have to be thinking about the ADA and the FMLA and, and these other statutes as well. So we're going to talk about that. Quickly, uh, we'd like to cover just each of the laws in isolation because there were some folks who said that they didn't have a, a great familiarity, particularly with the ADA. Uh, and I think the confusion in this area really stems from the um, ADAAA, um, at, so as the ADA was amended in 2009. But in general, the ADA prohibits employers from discriminating against a qualified individual with a disability because of the disability of that individual. And keep in mind the word qualified individual because that is one of the tools in your toolbox that we're going to talk about when it comes to assessing an employee and whether or not you need to accommodate him or her. The ADA applies to private employers with 15 or more employees. More than likely, you have a state uh, disability law that would also cover you if, if you're not covered by the ADA itself. The ADA also doesn't preempt other federal and state statutes. So you could be subject to the ADA, the FMLA, state leave laws, um, and either ERISA or workers' compensation at the same time. Again, the ADA protects a qualified individual with a disability, and this again is another key, who with or without reasonable accommodation can perform the essential functions of the position that is held or desired. Now, the definition of disability includes a physical or mental impairment that su substantially limits one or more of the major life activities of an individual. There are also other provisions of the ADA, for those of you who are not as familiar with it, that protect an individual also from being regarded as having a disability when in fact they don't have a disability. Um, or which protects somebody from having a record of having had a disability in the past. So it's important when you do your supervisor training to coach your uh, supervisors that the company could also run afoul of the ADA if a supervisor perceives someone or treats someone as having a disability when in fact they don't. So this might be the situation where somebody wants to return to work and the supervisor is saying, oh, well, no, I don't think you can do that even though they have a release to return. So that, that's not really the focus of our discussion today, but I just wanted to make you aware that in addition to actually having a physical or mental impairment, um, that substantially limits a major life activity, that there are additional provisions that can, can rise to the level of a disability under the ADA. So the ADA Amendments Act, which went into effect January 1, 2009, basically expanded the scope of the ADA um, to ensure that, that there was broad coverage of individuals under the Act. And uh, the whole purpose, really, of the Amendments Act was to reverse several Supreme Court decisions that had created a pretty high standard for uh, establishing a disability. So uh, the substantial limitation element that we talked about, uh, the EEOC has also explained that substantially limits is construed broadly. Additionally, major life, the, the term major life activity, so you have to have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. Again, the Amendments Act states that this provision shall not be interpreted to create a demanding standard for disability. And so now there is a non-exclusive list of major life activities that if someone is limited in, in performing, they have a disability under the ADA now. So if you do have somebody that meets that definition, then you must make reasonable accommodations for the employee or for the applicant. 
uh, unless you can demonstrate that doing so would cause an undue hardship. And for purposes of our discussion today, we're talking about accommodations such as permitting the use of paid leave, providing additional unpaid leaves of absence, um, flexible work schedules, reassignment to a vacant position, part-time schedules, and intermittent leave all of which are things that probably if you're an employer covered by the FMLA, you think about in the context of FEMLA coverage, but you may not think about as much when you're thinking about the ADA itself. So the next statute, and again, there is a lot of content in these slides and there are a lot of slides. I wanted to, um, Eric and I wanted to provide you with as much content as we could so that you could use this presentation as a resource when you do have those employee issues come up. But we're not going to go into every detail of determining if somebody is a covered employee under the FMLA because, quite frankly, that's a whole you know, separate presentation in and of itself. But um, just, so just in general, as many of you probably know, given the, the level of familiarity that we saw in the survey responses, a covered employer has to provide an eligible employee with up to 12, week, 12 weeks of unpaid leave during any 12-month period for a qualified reason. And a covered employee is someone who's worked for 12 months of employment and who also has 1,250 hours worked in the last 12 months and who is also working at a site where there are 50 or more employees within a 75-mile radius. The basic leave entitlements cover things like incapacity due to pregnancy, care for an employee's child after birth or placement for adoption, care for a spouse, son, daughter, parent with a serious health condition, or the individual's own serious health condition, and as you see here on this slide, the FMLA, for those of you who don't know, was also expanded in the last couple of years to provide for military leave under certain limited situations. And these next couple of slides go into some additional detail for you um, regarding what is a serious health condition. Again, um, this is something that you can study up on yourself a little bit more. The, these slides we are going to be emailing to everyone uh, within a week or so following the presentation. So wanted you all to have this content available. I'd like to jump now to Workers' Compensation Act in general and turn that over to Eric to um, address. Thanks, Amy. Uh, workers' compensation is really a different bird than what uh, we've been talking about up to now because it's unique to each of the states. Uh, it's basically a statutory framework that the states have put, each state puts together, which provides benefits to employees who have injuries that are job related. It provides for income replacement, which is typically referred to as temporary total disability, or in some cases, temporary partial disability, and also provides medical and rehabilitation expenses and it's regardless of whether the employee is at fault or not. There are some states that have provisions for reductions in benefits for certain egregious acts, but uh, for general purposes uh, and what you'll probably come across uh, during most of your uh, activity is uh, somebody who doesn't fall in that situation. Uh, I'm more familiar with Missouri and Illinois in terms of my practice, although I do have some experience with several other states, uh, Missouri and Illinois do not mandate leaves of absence. As I mentioned before, it's, uh, terminate, or the terms are temporary total disability or temporary partial disability, and it's usually a percentage of the state's average weekly wage up to a certain amount. Uh, the uh, temporary total disability benefits are compensation or is compensation for a period of time when the employee is taken off work by an authorized medical care provider due to a work injury. And that's basically when the doctor or the medical care provider says, this person can't work at all, then you're going to owe temporary total disability. Temporary partial disability is a little bit different. 
it's a limited benefit, and basically it's paid in situations where the authorized treating physician says that the employee can work, but sets limits on the number of hours or sets limits on their physical ability such that uh, the employer is not able to provide a full 40-hour work week. In those situations, typically what happens is the compensation is limited to two-thirds of the difference uh, that the employee was earning prior to the injury that the employee will be earning during this uh, period of temporary partial disability, or, and it's basically light duty work. Some terms that uh, you've probably heard uh, involved with workers' compensation are permanent partial disability, and that's the compensation uh, that the employee receives for the residual disability which is suffered as a result of a work injury. Typically that's uh, done through a settlement with either the employee directly or uh, an attorney if the employee re retains counsel. Uh, cases do get adjudicated. Uh, most states, they don't go through the typical uh, circuit courts. They'll have separate boards set up and an administrative law judge or hearing officer they call them different things in different states, uh, will hear those cases and make a decision after the evidence is presented. Occasionally you'll have a case of permanent total disability. Um, in that situation, you have a medical care provider who has said that the employee cannot return to any work at all at any position. That is rare, but it does happen on occasion. Typically what you'll have in that situation is a medical opinion and then you also have an opinion of a vocational rehabilitation expert who will take a look at all the medical records uh, and the injured worker's social and educational background and then, and then make that determination. So in general, I know one question that frequently gets posed to me, Eric, is you know, do I have to provide a leave of absence under the workers' compensation law? And the answer to that is no, right? Correct. Okay. It's a separate determination that's made by the medical care provider. And, and we're gonna, going to talk more about the overlap uh, once we get through these statutes and these acts individually. Finally, we have the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. This um, law has been around for a long time, like state workers' compensation acts, which have actually been around since the 1920s, Eric tells me. Um, ERISA has been around since 1974, and how it really comes into play here is that if an employer um, sponsors a plan or fund or a program to provide um, benefits in the event of sickness, accident, disability, death, unemployment, vacation, all of those things can constitute an employee welfare benefit plan and therefore be subject to ERISA. Now there are some governmental exceptions to ERISA as well as church plan exceptions to ERISA. If those apply to you, uh, you probably already know that, but what we frequently find is that even if you are dealing with a governmental plan or a church plan, those plans are frequently drafted to mirror the provisions that ERISA requires to be in these plans because they're kind of rare and the practitioners that draft them use kind of the model ERISA plans as their template. So even if you're not specifically governed by ERISA because you have one of those types of plans, this information that we're providing should still be helpful to you. Really for the purpose of today's presentation, when we talk about ERISA, we're talking about it in the context of short and long-term disability plans because those are the plans that are really going to interact with your leave of absence program. Generally, ERISA provides that a covered participant, so an employee who's eligible for short-term um, disability benefits, for example, under your plan, can file a claim for benefits and if that claim is denied and after the employee has exhausted whatever appeal um, provisions are set forth in the plan, then they can file a lawsuit in federal court or in state court to recover benefits under the plan, to enforce their rights under the plan, or to clarify their right to future benefits under the plan. 
um, like the discussion that we just had about workers' compensation, ERISA does not mandate leaves of absence, um, but it often, often overlaps with other uh, policies that do implicate leaves of absence, such as the FMLA um, and other leave of absence policies. Also, obviously, if you're on short-term disability, you are by definition on a leave of absence anyway. So now we are entering what I call a roadmap to the overlap. So we're getting away from the Bermuda Triangle and trying to figure out, uh, again, when you have an employee situation that might be impacted, how do you begin to sift through all of this and make your decision if you're an in-house lawyer or an external lawyer, how to advise your client, or if you're HR, how do I um, you know, begin to make sense of this to decide what's the right way to go with my employee. You have to start with the question of what laws am I dealing with, and this is going to vary a little bit depending on your state, but in large part, the federal laws do set the parameters that many of the state laws mirror. So you're going to be asking yourself, you know, is this person covered basically by any of the laws that we've just discussed? And are you in a state that might have its own state leave provisions? And in particular, on the screen you will see states that have family medical leave laws for private sector employees. These are some of the rules of the road to help with the overlap. So first, an employer may be covered at the same time by the ADA, the FMLA, and, and your State Workers' Compensation Act at the very same time. So you may need to assess your obligations under all three of those for an individual employee dealing with an individual issue. Likewise, you might be covered by the ADA, FMLA, and ERISA at the same time. You typically are not going to be covered by work comp and ERISA at the same time because your ERISA plan, um, your short-term, long-term disability plan, might be a better way to say that, is going to carve out situations that are covered by workers' compensation so that the employee gets the benefits under the Workers' Compensation Act but is not also eligible for short-term or long-term disability benefits for that same work-related injury. When there is coverage under multiple laws, you look at the highest denominator, basically. Uh, both the ADA and the FMLA expressly state, the ADA states several times now following the Amendments Act, that the law that provides the greatest level of protection is the one that's going to govern. And typically, when you're dealing with leaves of absence, either the ADA or the FMLA is going to provide that greatest level of protection. I want to talk about a couple of examples. Here we have an employee who's been employed for less than a year. She's pregnant. She's put on bed rest by her physician for three weeks. Um, and this happens two months before she's due to deliver. So she's not going to be entitled to leave under the FMLA leave, uh, uh, under the FMLA Act yet, um, because she's been employed for less than a year. She may be eligible for short-term disability benefits under the employer's short-term disability plan, depending on what the plan provides, but probably so if she's out of work for three weeks. Usually you'll see a short waiting period in an STD plan, but it's typically not more than three days to a week at the, the maximum. Um, obviously, doesn't implicate workers' compensation, but the question that frequently comes to me is, does this person have a disability under the ADA or the AD, um, AAA? And there's an interesting case that just came out on this pretty much exact issue. It was a situation where a woman um, had a baby that was going to be breached throughout her whole pregnancy, and she had been in the ER a couple of times, and this culminated with her being placed on bed rest. She
she went on bed rest, she came back and she was terminated, obviously not the wisest employment decision anyway, uh, but the question was whether she was protected by the ADA. Um, and the court held that there was a question of fact and denied summary judgment for the employer. And the court went to pretty great lengths to talk about the regulations under the ADA Amendments Act, um, basically saying that a routine pregnancy is not going to be covered by the ADA, but there's a distinction when a pregnancy-related impairment substantially limits a major life activity. And in this case, because of the impact that the pregnancy was having on this uh, individual, um, you know, her hospitalization, and she had a whole host of, you know, uh, inflammation issues and uh, anxiety associated with this, the court held that there was a question of fact as to whether this was a disability. So it's important to think about these types of situations even when you have somebody who's not eligible yet for the FMLA or maybe has exhausted the FMLA to determine whether there might be coverage under the ADA for that person. This next example is um, sort of in Eric's wheelhouse, deals with an employee who was employed in a factory as a production technician and her job was to package diapers. She had surgery for carpal tunnel, um, which she claimed was work-related, and she was out of work for the surgery. After the surgery, she came back in light duty, and after 180 days of working in light duty, um, she had reached maximum medical improvement but still could not perform her packaging job. The, the key in this example is that the employees reach maximum medical improvement. Each state words a little bit differently, but basically what you have with those three words is a physician saying that the person's not going to get any better from a physical standpoint, that they've plateaued and that's it. In that situation, you're not required to keep a position open uh, with uh, restrictions for that individual. Uh, you know, the doctor may say that the the restrictions are permanent, and in that case, then a decision would have to be made uh, whether you want to cover, uh, or I'm sorry, whether you want to continue to employ that person within those restrictions. Uh, again, it's not an open-ended uh, situation with light duty once they've reached maximum medical improvement. Uh, the light duty becomes, can become a permanent restriction once the doctor says it's maximum medical improvement. Right, and I think this is another area that kind of highlights the issues that clients frequently call me with. You know, we've had somebody who's on workers' compensation. We've held their job for a, a long period of time maybe because we didn't know if they were gonna, going to be coming back or they came back and we provided them with light duty do we now have to continue to provide this person with light duty now that we know they've reached you know, maximum medical improvement and aren't ever going to be able to, per to perform their job? And this also comes from an actual case, and it's um, a 2012 or 2011 or 2012 um, case, so very new is the bottom line. And in this case, the court said that at the time that this employee you know, had reached their maximum medical improvement, uh, and the employer went back and asked the physician for this employee, you know, what her limitations were at the time, and the limitations were still that she could only use her hands like zero to five percent of the time, that at that point, the employer did not have any obligation under the ADA to continue providing light duty to this person because she was not going to be able to return to her position and there was no foreseeable return to that position. So in this case, the employer found, the, I'm sorry, the court found that the employer had not violated the ADA by refusing to continue to extend light duty and going ahead and terminating this employee's employment. So I think um, as we're going to talk about one of the uh, additional tools in your employer toolbox is to always be thinking about that ADA uh, 
and to go back to the doctor and get information about the employee's ability to perform their job with or without accommodations before you take steps to terminate the employee or fill the position. And again, we'll get into this in a little bit more detail as we go here. Another question that frequently comes up um, as you look at all of these acts together is what notice does my employee have to provide to me? Under the FMLA, the employee for a foreseeable leave has to provide 30 days notice, but realistically, we know that many absences arise under intermittent family medical leave, uh, and in those circumstances, the test is as much notice as is practicable under the circumstances. The ADA does not have any hard deadlines for when must my employee provide notice. Instead, with the ADA, what the EEOC has said and courts have followed is that an employee does not have to use any magic words to request an accommodation. So for example, an employee who tells her supervisor, I'm having trouble getting to work at my scheduled start time because of my medical treatment, has made a request for an accommodation. Likewise, an employee who tells a supervisor, I need six weeks off to get treatment for a back problem, has made a request for an accommodation. Also, an employee who maybe is in a wheelchair and who informs their employer that the wheelchair can't fit under the desk in the office has made a request for an accommodation. But uh, an employee who just tells their supervisor that they want a new chair because their current chair is uncomfortable, for example, has not made a request for an accommodation because they've not linked this need to any type of medical condition. Um, In workers' compensation, it's a little bit different. Uh, most states do not require a written notice be given by the employee. Usually it's enough for the employee to say to his or her supervisor, you know, my wrists are bothering me or my fingers are tingling. You know, some employers in the industrial end of things you know, it's pretty obvious if the person comes to you and they've got a finger that's been sliced open or something like that. Uh, also, if your uh, company has a nurse on hand or some type of in-house health practitioner, uh, providing notice to that in-house health practitioner is usually sufficient under the work comp statute. Okay. And then under ERISA, uh, so your short-term and your long-term disability plans, those are going to specify the deadlines uh, which the employee, by which the employee has to put you on notice. Sometimes we see um, shortfalls in this area, both in plans that are insured and plans that are self-funded by employers. And so that's an area to take a look at your plan and make sure that they require, you know, notice of um, a disabling condition within, you know, X period of time so that you're not looking at information that's you know, very stale by the time that you get it. So another area for you to look into. Oh, somehow I went backwards there. Okay. So we talked about what notice the employee must provide. Now we're moving on to what notice the company must provide. Uh, in general, under the FMLA, the employer has an obligation to provide the eligibility notice and the notice of rights and responsibilities within five business days of a request for FMLA. Uh, these are forms that are available on the Department of Labor website. Likewise, the employer has five business days within receipt of all of the employees uh, supporting documentation for leave of absence to provide the notice designating the leave as FMLA. As we just talked about, the ADA doesn't require um, a written request from an employee, nor does it require a written response from an employer, but we'll talk about best practices a little bit later in terms of documenting your efforts that you've made to accommodate an employee. In terms of workers' compensation, what the employer is really doing is providing notice to the state. Uh, in Missouri, for example, the employer will file, fill out a report of injury and file that with the state. It's important to do that as quickly as possible for a couple reasons. First, uh, you want to try and get a control of the medical as soon as you can in states where the employer is allowed to direct the medical. And if you uh, delay in responding to a request for treatment for an injury, that can be taken as a denial of medical benefits and the employee can go 
to whomever they want. Uh, secondly, uh, filing a timely report of injury begins with tolling on the statute of limitations for a claim for compensation to be filed. So uh, if you get a timely report of injury filed, you can begin that statute running. You can also reduce the amount of time that the employee would have to file a legitimate claim for compensation. What medical information can I, as an employer, obtain? Um, the questions that you're going to be asking yourself or that you're going to be counseling your clients to ask is, do I have all the necessary medical information? Am I entitled to get the information that I'm lacking? Do I want, to, or, well, do I have the right to require a medical exam? Um, do I want the medical information that maybe I'm lacking? and have I satisfied my obligation to keep medical information separate from other information. Kind of walking through the ADA's requirements first, in order to make a medical inquiry under the ADA, the inquiry has to be job related and consistent with business necessity. What that essentially means is it has to be required for assessing whether the employee or the individual can perform the job at issue. If the, employee, um, if the employee's need for an accommodation or if their disability is not apparent, uh, then you as an employer can obtain a physician's response to certain directed questions. And the way we typically do this is by giving the employee a letter to take to their doctor, asking the doctor to describe any impairment or restriction to the employee in performing the essential functions of his or her job, to describe the nature and severity of any impairment or restriction, and most importantly, to describe any accommodation that will assist the employee in performing the essential functions of the employee's position and to specify the anticipated duration for any accommodations. And again, we'll be sending these slides out to everyone, so as you're drafting your own letters, you have those um, specific items that we recommend asking. The FMLA is loaded with provisions about what information, what medical information you can and can't request. As most of you know, there is a certification of health care provider form um, that you can require an employee to have their doctor complete to determine if a need for leave um, that, that's requested for the employees or uh, family members' serious health condition is appropriate under the Act. Uh, you would request that uh, within five business days of receipt of the employee's request. You also can request a recertification, but generally no more often than every 30 days unless the circumstances have changed um, related to the employee's need for leave or you receive information that casts doubt on the stated reason for the leave. Um, at, at the very minimum, you can always request recertification every six months in connection with an associate's FMLA leave for a serious health condition. And you can also request a new medical certification with the first absence in a new 12-month leave period. So. Um, the FMLA essentially says that the most, frequent you can re most frequently you can request is every 30 days, but if the certification um, certifies the leave for a longer period of time, then you have to wait for up to six months unless you have some of these special circumstances that are outlined here on this slide. In workers' compensation, you've kind of got a parallel system running. In states uh, where you're not allowed to direct the medical benefits uh, and care, uh, I extend my sympathies. In states like Missouri, where you are allowed to uh, control the medical care, uh, obviously you're allowed access to those medical records. Typically what happens is uh, when the injury first is reported and uh, sent off to the workers' compensation insurance carrier, that claims adjuster will have the injured worker sign a release allowing them access to that information from the doctor. <coughs> In states where the employee 
directs his or her own medical care, that's a little tougher. Uh, you're not allowed, some states don't allow any type of ex parte, which means uh, basically contact with the, the doctor without the attor other attorney's knowledge. In that situation, you're going to be reduced to either uh, obtaining the records through a subpoena or through, a, uh, through the uh, claimant's attorney. Uh, now, if uh, you've got a situation with uh, FMLA uh, and workers' comp, typically if somebody's receiving uh, FMLA benefits, they're not going to qualify for workers' comp. They're not allowed to double dip. Um, so for, for FMLA situations where the FMLA and work comp might apply, um, the, and the Work Comp Act allows you to um, get more information from the employee, then you can use that information in determining the employee's entitlement to um, FMLA as well as the, the workers' compensation. So um, although they're not allowed to double dip, you could still track the workers' compensation time as FMLA time for purpose of exhausting the FMLA leave. Uh, under ERISA, you can obtain whatever information is necessary um, as set forth in your short-term or long-term disability plan to enable you to make your benefits determination. So typically, you're going to see language in a short-term or long-term disability plan to the effect that the employee has the burden of providing objective medical evidence of their inability to perform their own job or a broad class of jobs. And the FMLA has a special provision for paid time off policies in short-term and long-term disability plans that again says that information that's provided in connection with a paid leave policy or a disability plan can also be used to determine eligibility for FMLA provided that the employer puts the employee on notice that that information only needs to be provided in connection with the receipt of paid benefits. So, um, I have several clients that rather than using the FMLA certification of health care provider for situations where disability benefits also apply, they just have them complete the certification um, under the disability plan and then use the information that they gather under that plan for purposes of deciding whether the person is also entitled to FMLA, which again is one of those tools to help you streamline your, your paperwork. Can I require a medical examination? Uh, with respect to the ADA, this is one of those issues that I frequently get asked, can I require this? But I rarely see employers actually send somebody out to get a medical examination to determine if someone is really entitled to an accommodation under the ADA. Typically, um, we go with what the, what the employee's doctor has said for a whole variety of reasons. Um, but in terms of what the law requires, the ADA doesn't prevent an employer from requiring an employee to go to an appropriate health care professional of the employee's choice, um, of the employer's choice, I'm sorry, if the employee provides insufficient documentation from their treating physician to substantiate that the employee has a disability and needs reasonable accommodation. Before you get there, however, you would need to explain to your employee or the employee why the documentation is insufficient and give the employee an opportunity to provide the missing information in a timely manner to you. Um, if the employee fails in that regard or if you get information that um, seems unreliable, then you certainly can consider consulting um, with the employee's uh, doctor with the employee's consent before you require an employee to go to a healthcare professional of, of your choice. You also want to think about, you know, do I really want whatever information I might get from a healthcare professional that I send my employee to? And if you are going to have an employee examined, make sure that you've done your homework and you know, talked to the doctor that's going to be examining your employee and gotten some background information about that employee's particular condition and what some of its side effects um, could be before you 
go down that road. FMLA, again, many, many medical provisions. If you have reason to doubt the validity of a medical certification, you may require that the associate obtain a second opinion from a health care provider chosen by the company at the company's cost. And the associate is entitled to take leave pending uh, the act of obtaining the uh, second certification. And then if the first and second opinions differ and you're, you know, thinking you're going to go with the second opinion, then you should require the associate to obtain a third opinion at the company's expense. And for the third opinion, the health care provider is chosen by the employee and the employer, and the determination is final and binding. Um, this is a situation where you don't get to obtain second opinions when you're just in a recertification process. So when I mentioned earlier that every 30 days, um, but at least every six months, you're entitled to go get a new, um, to have the employee recertify for a medical condition that they've been placed out for, you don't get the right to do a second or third opinion in connection with those recertifications. So if you have something that's rare or if you have a condition that maybe is going to cause intermittent absences and um, really wreak havoc in the workplace, then you should certainly consider upfront requiring that second opinion um, because once you forego it, you don't have the opportunity for another whole leave year. And I see that we've got some questions coming in. We're going to wait to answer questions until the end because we still have lots of slides to get through. Um, but we will either get to the questions or we'll send answers out with our, with our slides. In terms of workers' compensation, medical examinations usually come up in those jurisdictions where the employee can choose his or her own medical care. Uh, most states will allow an employer to have an independent medical examination or a qualified medical examination. Again, the terminology differs a little bit, but the, re the end result is basically the same. You're allowed to have a medical examination of an injured worker. Again, you can't, uh, you know, do it every couple of months, but, you know, once a year is probably a good rule of thumb depending upon the nature and extent of the injury. Uh, and, again, it's somebody you choose, but uh, uh, the, that doesn't necessarily mean that the, that uh, physician or medical care provider is going to take over the medical care in those states where the employee uh, gets to choose. And then finally, for ERISA, in generally, in generally, I've been talking a lot, can you tell? In general, uh, a short and long-term disability plan is always going to reserve the right to do an independent exam. If you um, have a provision like that in your plan, though, and you never exercise the right to do an independent exam, you may be causing yourself trouble when you do get into a lawsuit because frequently those provisions are used to argue that the employer didn't um, do a full and fair review of the claim because they just relied on medical records as opposed to sending the person to have um, an actual examination. So think about whether you're actually going to use that provision if it's in your plan, and if you're not, you might want to think about tweaking that plan provision. Can I ask what, per what prescriptions an employee is taking? Uh, in general, the answer is stay away from asking about specific provisions. Under the ADA, the EEOC takes the position that asking an employee about his or her use of prescription medications is not job related. Um, there may be exceptions where somebody is employed in a security capacity or where they have a condition that you know they are taking, um, you know, narcotics that could um, present some kind of direct threat to the workplace. So really you have to think about the direct threat analysis as to whether you're justified to ask for that information under the ADA, but it's going to be rare. Under the FMLA, you can ask for um, whether medication has been prescribed, but not what medication has been prescribed. In workers' comp, uh, what we're talking about here mainly is prescriptions that may have been uh, as a result of 
the work injury itself and are prescribed by the authorized treating physician in jurisdictions where the employer controls the medical care. Typically, uh, employees have to provide the employer and its insurance carrier access to those medical records to determine off work status and that type of stuff in order to qualify for those benefits. And again, I think we've already covered under ERISA, but generally, yes, if your plan um, provides that the employee is going to have to provide treatment records, which almost all of them do, to get short-term or long-term disability benefits, then that is also going to trigger your ability to obtain prescription information. So if you have an employee who's eligible for short-term disability um, and completes the short-term disability forms to cover both the short-term disability request for paid benefits and workers' compensation, or I'm sorry, and FMLA, then you're going to, to be able to get that prescription information and look at it for the full picture of, of their leave. Whereas if you were just looking at the FMLA itself, you wouldn't be able to obtain that information. The $50 million question that everyone always wants to be answered to, do I have to hold this employee's job? Uh, under the ADA, an employee is entitled to the position that they held prior to a leave unless the position is no longer available because holding it would have been an undue hardship. Under the FMLA, as many of you know, the employee is entitled to return to the same job or a job that is substantially the same with the same pay, um, terms of employment, et cetera, uh, after their, they exhaust their 12 weeks of, of or during the 12 week um, leave protection. Workers' comp, again, you don't have to uh, hold the job open for them. Uh, you know, the, again, the term maximum medical improvement can sometimes come into play here. If the physician has put the injured worker at maximum medical improvement and given that worker restrictions such as they can't return to that prior job, you're not required to uh, hold that job open for them or offer it to them uh, upon their return, obviously. Uh, you are going to face some increased exposure in terms of permanent partial disability in that situation because most of the administrative law judges who handle these cases are going to take into account this, that the employee was unable to return to his or her prior job because of the severity of the injury. Okay. Um, let's see here. Another question that frequently comes up, is the employee entitled to light duty? I, we covered this a little bit earlier, but the ADA doesn't require an employer to create light duty, um, but it does require an employer to provide an accommodation by eliminating marginal job functions. So um, if a job can be um, altered to eliminate marginal but not key job functions, then that would be an accommodation. But creating a whole separate position um, that's a position that the company doesn't normally have is not something that you have to do as an accommodation. Under the FMLA, uh, if an employee requests FMLA, an employer can offer an employee light duty instead, but they cannot require that the employee um, take light duty. Under workers' comp, uh, you know, returning to light duty is really one of the areas I see as uh, an employer having the, uh, the greatest impact on a worker's compensation claim. If you can find something for that employee to do within those light duty restrictions, I highly encourage it. Uh, I think for, it works for the employer on several levels. One, it cuts off the TTD, which will eventually reduce your exposure for uh, future uh, premiums. Also, I think it encourages the employee to see this as a transitional period and not uh, as something that's going to be an entitlement to them. At some point down the road, you know, depending on the severity of the injury, you're going to have people who start to see TTD benefits as an entitlement and not uh, a right under the law, and it's going to be real difficult to get them back to work at that point. Right. And then under a short-term or long-term disability plan, Frequently, um, benefits are contingent upon participating in a return to work program. So if the employee's restrictions have been lessened and the employer offers light duty, 
typically an employer can require the employee to participate in such a program in order to receive benefits under the disability plan. Um, sometimes employers do that as an incentive, so uh, they will allow an employee to still receive a certain percentage of their um, short-term disability benefits and then also to get the, the pay under the short-term disability plan up to a certain provision or a certain threshold level. So you can do that um, as an incentive as well. We're going to go ahead and skip to the tools to reduce impact because I know we're at the top of the hour here and some of you may need to drop off. Again, if you do need to leave, know that we'll be sending these slides out and we'll probably include some responses to some question and answers with that. Uh, but I know that the reason that many of you dialed in was to figure out how do I control the madness <laughs> as it pertains to FMLA uh, in particular. So the first thing that I would say is you need to train your supervisors to require notice of leave. Um, we've talked about what the, the notice requirements are under the FMLA, but your supervisors need to know what they can say. Um, one thing that, that I've done for my clients is to prepare, prepare a talking sheet that helps guide the supervisors through what they can say when they find out somebody's been approved for um, example, for an intermittent leave. Um, so the, the supervisor would tell the employee, you know, that they have to provide um, 30 days notice of, of leave for, you know, any um, anticipated leave time, but for an unscheduled or unforeseeable um, situation that they know it must provide the notice as soon as practicable. They have to follow the normal call-in procedures and of course that's absent some extenuating circumstances but that's something for HR and legal to consider on the back end whether there were extenuating circumstances. Um, and if the employee doesn't follow those usual call-in procedures then they're subject to discipline under the regular employer rules. Um, also if, if the treatment um, is if they're scheduling treatment or scheduling appointments, then the supervisor can tell the employees that they need to be scheduling those after work if possible, and if they don't do so, then you can require them to reschedule those appointments. Another tool in the toolbox is to require a written notice of use of intermittent FML. So an employee can be required to um, provide notice of use of intermittent FML and one way that some employers do this is to require the employee to fill out a sheet each time he or she uses intermittent FML so that um, it's documented that the employee left an hour early or came in two hours late um, or whatever the situation may be so that they're not calling in to some supervisor line saying that their car won't start and then, you know, six months down the road when there's no longer documentation claiming, oh, well, that was for FML. So, again, this helps you control the leaves of absence a little bit better by putting some accountabilities on the employee which are appropriate. You want to require a complete certification of health care provider as we've already talked about. Um, you can require a certification, but in addition, you need to make sure that that certification has been filled out appropriately at the beginning before you approve that absence, because once you approve it, you can't go back and say, oh, well, wait, we didn't understand this or this isn't clear to us. So if you have items that are unclear, you need to write back to the employee. I tell my clients, send them back a copy of the certification, highlight on the certification what additional information is needed, and ask for that information back in seven days. If they don't provide it in the seven days, and if there's no, you know, circumstances that would warrant an extension, like the doctor's been out of the country or, you know, was not available to see them, then you can deny the FML, and you should deny the FML under those circumstances if you don't have the, the appropriate certification. Uh, another um, key is to track the intermittent FMLA leave and compare it to the certification. So if the certification says the employee needs to be absent for one day a week for six weeks to undergo medical treatment, then you need to be reviewing the actual absences to make sure that they mirror up with what the certification said. If they do not, then you need to go back to the doctor and ask for a recertification. Um, and, you know, 
two things. Yes, doctors say what employees want them to say in a lot of circumstances, but if employees know that this is being monitored and that they are being held accountable, they're less likely to uh, abuse. Obtain recertification as often as it's permitted. Talked about that. Require a second or third opinion if you have reason to doubt the validity because you can't go back and do it in the same leave year if you don't do it at the very beginning. And this is a big one. Apparently, um, you know, there are industries still that don't mandate the use of PTO um, when someone is taking FMLA, and you certainly can require that an associate exhaust their paid time off. Um, you cannot require that an employee pop up, for example, from Social Security, or I'm sorry, from short-term disability, say your short-term disability plan provides 60% benefit, you can't require them to use that additional 40% um, from their PTO bank to supplement because that's then considered a paid leave of absence. But for an unpaid um, FMLA leave, you can require that the employee use their PTO time, if your policy says that. You can also transfer an associate to a different position during a planned um, intermittent FML. Now, a lot of times they get the question from employers, well, can I transfer somebody who is, you know, has chronic migraines, so we never know when the person is going to be coming into work, or somebody who has morning sickness. Um, and the answer in those circumstances is no, because the employee isn't um, taking a planned intermittent FML in that situation. Um, this would be more of the situation of, you know, regularly scheduled chemotherapy treatments. If there's a position that would better accommodate those, then you could transfer the employee during their intermittent leave. Moving on to your ADA toolbox. We didn't get a chance to talk earlier about no-fault attendance policies, but if you are um, an employer that has a no-fault attendance policy or if you have clients that still have these attendance policies, be, um, be mindful of the fact that this is something that's on the um, radar of the EEOC. There have been several large claims um, and settlements entered into with the, F with the EEOC because the allegation is that um, these no-fault leave policies don't take into account the fact that an employee's absence could be due to a disability. And so whereas you typically see no-fault policies carving out um, the FMLA, Oftentimes they don't carve out the ADA, or even if they do, a supervisor might not be sophisticated enough to be thinking about whether that employee has said enough to trigger um, that interactive process under the ADA. Also, um, by adopting a discretionary attendance policy in lieu of a no-fault policy, it helps curb FMLA abuse because the employee doesn't necessarily know if they miss work one more time, then they're going to be um, disciplined under the attendance policy. So it helps prevent employees running to FEMLA um, as a shield to keep them from being disciplined under an attendance policy. We talked about this briefly. Um, before filling jobs for an individual who's exhausted their FMLA leave, obtain medical information from the doctor so that you know whether you're looking at an employee who can't return to work for another six months or an employee who can't return to work just for another six days. Obviously, those are two different situations and your ability to defend those um, claims will come out differently depending on what the medical shows but you need to be engaging in that interactive process with your employees before you fill a job that the individual holds. And you also, while you're not required to um, keep documentation of, you know, while you're not required to put in writing the accommodations that have been offered, the best practice is to certainly do so because frequently an employer offers accommodations that are declined by the employee uh, and then, you know, 
the, the law doesn't require you to provide the exact accommodation that the employee wants as long as you've made efforts to reasonably accommodate those. So you want to be able to show that you've done that. We're going to talk about a couple of workers' compensation tools as well. A couple of things to keep in mind with workers' compensation cases. You need to be diligent in communicating with the claims adjuster. He or she is going to be your best source in terms of what the current return to work status is for the injured worker. Uh, if you have a light duty or transitional return to work program, whatever you want to call it, um, make sure the claims adjuster knows about that and what the parameters of that program are because the adjuster can then let the treating physician know and the physician can then be aware and hopefully make uh, accommodation with uh, restrictions so that person can get back to work uh, quicker. Uh, Again, uh, in terms of the benefits, it help, that helps cut off your exposure for temporary total disability, which helps limit your uh, loss experience and will help you with your workers' compensation benefits. Uh, it also helps uh, in terms of getting the uh, employee put at maximum medical improvement, which is really what you want so that you cut off uh, additional medical expenses and TTD. Uh, if the claims adjuster has uh, uh, access to it, which he or she should, see if she'll, he or she will provide you with treatment records in a timely manner so you can monitor progress again uh, in conjunction with those light duty programs. You may be more familiar with your own program than the claims adjuster is, uh, and hopefully you are. And you'd be able to, you know, call the adjuster and say, "Hey, I think we can accommodate these restrictions and get this individual back to work." Uh, HIPAA is a big concern, or has been in the past. Technically, the stat HIPAA statute says workers' compensation uh, does not apply to HIPAA. The problem is, you at these different healthcare facilities, you have people who are used to dealing with HIPAA releases and. Typically what I recommend to clients is that they just go ahead and prepare a HIPAA compliant release so that if they need to obtain those records, you're not bickering back and forth with the medical care provider because that's, you know, the ultimate goal really is to get the records. Okay. And then last but not least, um, your, your biggest and best tool is to bring all of your information together. So. Um, what that means is don't have your FMLA administered by one group, your short-term disability administered by another group, your work comp administered by another vendor, because then all of the benefits of the information that you could be getting and your, your ability to view the whole picture um, is substantially thwarted. So to the extent that um, you know, I'm seeing more and more clients bringing these functions in-house where they have a team that um, you know, manages maybe a self-funded disability plan as well as FMLA um, and work comp. I, I've seen that work successfully. There are also outside vendors that do all three of those things. Um, obviously, FMLA is um, a highly regulated law, so to the extent you are outsourcing that, you need to make sure that um, you're, you're in good hands in that regard. Uh, that is the end of our presentation. We do have a few questions that we're going to answer, um, but for those of you who aren't able to stay, thank you very much for participating. We hope this has been helpful. One question that I have for the audience, if you have time to respond um, to the chat feature, it would be great, is uh, if you have a tool that you use that, to track family medical leave, um, or to track your leave of absence, whether it's an Excel spreadsheet or a certain program. If you would tell me what that program is or if you have a spreadsheet that you're willing to share, I'd love to see that. I've gotten several questions today from people who are looking for a resource to use and I'd like to be able to give that back to the audience uh, when we send out the slide presentation. So I appreciate uh, anything you all can share in that regard. Um, we had a question about someone who has an individual uh, on maternity leave who just had a baby. They've been able to get her to um, have been able to get her to say when and if she will return to work. I think that means they oh, haven't no, been able no, to um, get her to say if she will be returning. And I believe the question is, can they 
ask her if she intends to return to work. And that depends a little bit on whether the Family Medical Leave Act applies. If the FMLA applies, um, then you can require an employee to report periodically on their status and their intent to return to work. Um, you, if the employee gives unequivocal notice of their intent not to return to work, then the obligations under the FMLA to maintain health benefits um, and to restore the employee to his or her position cease. But if the employee um, indicates that they're unable to return to work, but they express a continued desire to return to work, then um, you still have the obligation to hold the position and continue health coverage. Um, if the FMLA does not apply uh, and you're just dealing with an ADA situation, then absent this individual having had a complicated um, you know, pregnancy, then pregnancy in and of itself is not a disability under the ADA. So um, in that regard, there would be nothing that would prohibit you from asking the employee what his or her intentions are to return to work. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, let's see. As I said, we'll be providing a copy of the slides. We've gotten that question a couple times, as well as uh, a link to the actual audio. Have another question asking us to discuss whether a condition such as irritable bowel syndrome that might not interfere with actual job duties but might chronically impact an employee's ability to come to work on time or to remain at work for the duration of the normal work week requires an accommodation of the irregular, unpredictable work schedules. Um, you know, this is a difficult one because it's very hard to accommodate other than providing, um, you know, intermittent leaves of absence, which as you saw earlier in the presentation can be a reasonable accommodation. It would depend on what the employee's job is, um, you know, whether that, whether the employee can work from home, whether you have other employees who work from home. So if they're, you know, a service call person who can dial in, um, then then that might be a reasonable accommodation. But yes, I certainly would go through the interactive process, document the employee's request and the employer's recommendation for accommodations for that employee, and then make an, a company determination as to what accommodations, if any, could be offered and provide those back to the employee in writing so that you can, do, you can document, document the process that you've gone through. Uh, another question, an employee who was put on complete bed rest for pregnancy by the doctor was not eligible for disability until October, um, late October recently. Um, the baby arrived before the eligible date and the employee has not stated if they can return to work. I think that's the, the same question as the one that we had before. If not, please feel free to email me and we can talk about that situation. And for those of you who are interested in spreadsheets, um, one user says that they use Apex software, IHR for leave management, and um, another uses an access program to monitor their FMLA leave. So as I said, I'll continue to gather some uh, information on, on those responses and we'll provide it to the group. So I really hope this has been helpful to you. Um, if there are other questions or topics that are of interest to you, please shoot myself or Eric an email so that we can follow up with Miratas and, and maybe do a follow-up session. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for participating. Amy and Eric, thank you so much for sharing all of your expertise in this area. Um, as was mentioned earlier, a copy of today's presentation as well as a link to the recording will be sent to you within the, co within the next coming days. Um, if you have further questions, Amy and Eric's contact details will be included in that email so you can continue to connect with them. So thank you again for participating. Thank you. Please stand by.